Hi, I'm Phil. Yeah, I had more hair there. Um, and I work for SoundCloud with Alex. So he's my boss. I'll try not to contradict him. Sometimes it's a bit too hard, but I think we can get some compromise. <laughs> oh yeah, he's still in the room. Uh, so the one interesting thing about SoundCloud, as Alex was saying, uh, we are growing a lot. Uh, we, we would love to be able to hire someone every week, uh, at least for some time, until we reach the number we think is OK. Uh, but it's not that easy to find these people. And one of the reasons it's not that easy is that we are quite strict in our recruitment process. And if you, if you pay attention to what Alex was saying, please say you was, your work attention. Uh, it's because we do give a lot of freedom to our people. We, the first thing you get on, when you join SoundCloud is a pair of headphones and the SSA key that gives you access to pretty much everything. So, and to be honest, if you join my team, I, don't, I will help you set up your machine. I'll try to help you with whatever we can. But I, won't be, I don't want to be babysitting you. I want to be there to support you and have some SoundCloud-specific problem like where the hell is the coffee machine? Or why are the instructions in English and German at the same time? Uh, so this is the kind of stuff we will help you, we're going to help you with, but we are not going to keep an eye on what you're doing to make sure you're not doing something wrong. We hired you. We think you should be doing the right thing. We hope so. And well, first, forgot. Please click. Um, the, so the way we try to be, the way to try to funnel candidates is applying, uh, it's actually a very simple method compared to some companies I've been to before, which is like a couple of steps. Uh, you, you click the link, you send a resume, someone's probably going to call you. Um, they're going to have a chat with you and they're like, okay, so I'm going to send you a coding challenge. So it's a small problem. The nature of the problem depends on what kind of background you have. Um, I, I'm what we call a back -end engineer, so it's gonna be a web app with some funniness in the, um, in the back end. But it's still end-to-end, -end, so you have to develop it, the interface and stuff. Uh, so you receive that code review. You have pretty much as much time as you think you need to solve it. And we received that, that we probably just put it up on GitHub. We received that, we take a look, and then we may invite you in for interviews, or just say, yeah, sorry. Uh, interviews, I had, I was in the UK when I applied for SoundCloud. I made, I think, six interviews over Skype. Then they flew me to Berlin, and then I had six interviews again. Uh, so it takes forever, I admit that. Uh, but it's just because we're trying to make sure we are behind the right people. Not only you're right for us, but we are also right for you, because we, some people need a bit more structure than we can offer. What I've learned, though, um, in the past years hiring people, and I was a consultant before, and if you worked in a consulting company, your business is to sell people's time. So the way you scale is by hiring more people. And also, this is a premium company. So premium company. Uh, it's because, so they want, to, they want to hire people who can, who they can sell to the clients and be sure that that guy is going to be doing a good job. So they are quite strict as well. And what I've learned is that the code review is probably the most important stage on everything. It, unfortunately, we sometimes have to reject people that shouldn't have been rejected, and we, they are more than, well, we're more than happy for them to apply again. But uh, we have to be absolutely sure that this code is acceptable. And then again, this is some code you spent whatever time you had, whatever time you asked for building to show off, right? It's your time to just deliver this guy something that's brilliant, something that's great. We kind of expect people to put a lot of effort and not just hack some shit together and move across. And if you can't, like, even if you have time and you're applying for a job, you can't get code right. Mm, yeah, funny. So, um, this is based, oh, by the way, we don't really tell you which language you should use. SoundCloud is mostly a Ruby shop. Um, I, my background is mostly Java, even though as a consultant I've done everything. Uh, but we are mostly a Ruby shop, but we have projects in Scala, we have projects in C, in Go. I think we may have projects in Clojure. We definitely have a project in Haskell I found out about last week. Um, and anyway, we, we like people who can write software. Well, sometimes we hire Python people because they're like, yeah, Python, Ruby, they hate each other, but they love each other. Uh, but then again, back to my graph. 
So this is uh, based on the, co the, the, the challenges I've reviewed and uh, across my team a bit as well. So I've been you know, at SoundCloud only for six months, so that's the, my experience in the past six months. I'm just off probation, congratulations to me. Um, and this is a distribution across languages, right? So Ruby, Java, JavaScript, C, Clojure, Scala. The, I, I'm pretty sure those are the only languages I got um, challenged challenge back on. And interesting, uh, the other day I was reviewing some Node.js code, again, and I was so curious that I had to crawl my um, email inbox and try to find what the patterns are. And I found something like this. This is not exact, but it's very close to reality. Which is, uh, so red is people didn't get invited to an interview. Green is they came in for an interview, or at least they received an invite to come. That doesn't mean they were hired. It just we, we brought the guy in and had him talking to people. So if you look at that, Ruby is pretty much half-half. You know, if you guys, it's like a Rails cool kid, he's probably going to use shit that I'm, I'm not really a big fan of. Uh, Java, I'd say it's because it's so low, like the number of submissions in Java received is not really great, but those we received were okay. Um, I'll skip JavaScript. C, I've received a couple and it's just, I think for people who have never done C before, but thought, oh, these guys are so hardcore and scalability, yeah, let's put it in C. And mm, it wasn't very good. Closure and Scala, now I'm completely biased because I do like these two languages. Uh, but I think it's just because people were cocky enough to send submission, or to send challenge um, completions on those languages. So they kind of knew what they were doing. Uh, and Node.js is something that surprises me because JavaScript is an okay language. Uh, and it's still, so many of the submissions are just rubbish. It's not good. It's just code that I do, I'm not sure how people wrote it. And so, but don't get me wrong, it's SoundCloud, it's Berlin, we are hipsters. It doesn't really matter if you write a fixie, it doesn't really matter if you wear funny clothes and funny glasses, everyone's a hipster. And at SoundCloud, we have very um, geeky hipsters, because if you look, this is something from our mailing list. Uh, we have a, a ton of uh, mailing lists, but this is the one where we talk about, I think the description for this list is, anything sort of kind of related to development. Um, so if you, uh, it's, I don't think you could read, but there's something about implementing a structural type system in Ruby. There's something about the new talk by this color guy who said that blah, blah, blah is rubbish. And the conversation just goes on and on and on forever. So this is us. We, are, we, are, we like languages. We like different approaches. We do have Node.js projects. It's not that we don't like, we, well, our new website, um, you guys may have seen, we launched in private beta Monday. It's pretty much all JavaScript. So it's not that we don't like it, it's just we're not sure why the industry is, or at least people who are talking to us, are a bit below the mark. And here comes the dark slides. Is it readable? Yeah? Okay, cool, awesome. So that was supposed to be an animation that pops up after I made the funny comment. Uh, this is, <laughs> I try to obfuscate, uh, and this is not from a sample we received, so I, I wouldn't actually expose someone like this, but this is a typical project I see when I'm doing any JavaScript slash, slash Node.js work. Uh, this is the kind, of file, the kind of thing I get. It's not OO, it's not functional, it's just procedural code, and not good procedural code. It's not the kind of stuff that I want people writing in C, or if Pascal, if that was whatever you had to write. Um, and why, but why, is this, why does this happen? Why someone would get this language, which has so many different features, and this brand new platform with all this async callback, all this kind of stuff, and write code which cyclomatic complexity 2 billion because so many ifs and tries and catches and everything. What's going on? What I find, uh, what I think, is that, again, a bit of a hipster culture, yeah, nothing is any good if someone else likes it. And all these object-oriented books, dude, this is not Java, right? Relax, chill out, and let's forget about all this. It's much simpler. Well, the problem is that we're kind of throwing away the baby with the bathtub. So it's okay that you don't want to, I don't know, you think that maybe the 
the best way to use Java generics is not relevant in JavaScript or Ruby or whatever. Fair enough, probably they are not. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing that you can use. There's decades of software engineering practices in a lot of computer science as well applied to those techniques. You, you, we need to know what to extract in and out. So what do we need? What can we use? Uh, functional programming is a passion of mine. And even though I don't think I've ever been into a big functional programming project, uh, I'm really trying, maybe because of that, I'm really trying to figure out what's a good way to write a program in a functional level, in a functional, not only the functional language, but in a functional way, and it's to apply what I believe is good from my object-oriented background, which is like low, you know, cohesion, coupling, yada, yada, yada. Um, with JavaScript specifically, I'm very happy because the first functional language I ever wrote code in was Lisp, was Common Lisp, and I'm, I'm one of those Lispers in the closet kind of thing. I, I, these days are getting out more, but I, I really like it. And <clears throat> you know, there was all this backlash from JavaScript. Oh, JavaScript was lucky. JavaScript was there on the right time. Otherwise, this rubbish language would never make good uh, big time. And this is a very long comment by uh, Brendan Knight, who was the creator of JavaScript, uh, complaining about people saying that. It's like that's not reality, you know. And he's I think over the past years he's been really hurt because he had like 15 days to develop JavaScript and he did a very nice job for what we had. Uh, but one interesting thing about this specific um, comment is quoted here. It's when he says um, that he was quite influenced by uh, a book called A Structured Interpretation of Computer Programs. If you haven't read it, just do it. Uh, and he was pretty much hired to do Scheme. So Scheme is a di dialect of Lisp. There's two major dialects these days, Common Lisp and Scheme. And like, it's, so it's inspired by Scheme heavily. And that's actually true when you start looking at that. And if you look at Scheme, it's like, ah, I, I see the relationship. So now that we know that it was inspired by Scheme and it's close enough, maybe we can recycle some of our old school knowledge on how to build programs in Scheme and this kind of functional language and apply it to JavaScript. Uh, so this book is called How to Design Programs. Uh, I have a hard copy and I'm proud of it, as you can see with this rubbish picture. Uh, but it's available, freely available online. It's pretty much one of the only books that teach you how to write programs in an object-oriented way, uh, sorry, functional way. Uh, you have both load of books about how to do that for object-oriented languages. You do have a lot about procedural programming. You don't have anything but this pretty much, and the book I was talking about before, structure interpretation of computer programs, uh, to teach you about how to, how to create a program based on functions. And the most amazing thing is that these guys really don't care about functions. They're just teaching you how to write a program, a good program, using the tools they had, which is functions. But anyway. Um, this, which you <laughs> definitely can't read, is one of the pages. Uh, there's, uh, this is where they explain to you how to use functions to abstract. So, you know, in a language like Java, C Sharp, C++, use classes as abstractions. Uh, in a functional programming language, you're pretty much aiming to use functions as abstractions. That's your building block. That's the kind of stuff you use a lot. Obviously, just like in a language like Ruby, you have classes, you have objects, you have meta classes and all this crazy shit, and then you have blocks. And they are kind of related, but they are different tools used in different situations. It's the same for functional programming, but across all functional programming languages, you're going to see that the function should be the core of what you're building. It should be your, 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 yeah, your building block, the bricks you lay. Uh, so here's the, and then, things okay. This example in Scheme. Uh, don't, don't worry too much about syntax. I made a presentation, uh, I have a presentation in Finland a couple of months ago, and I decided to do it in Clojure, which is a Lisp, and unfortunately I had to spend the whole time of the presentation explaining the parentheses, and I didn't get my point across. But in this case, just don't worry too much about that, uh, but what that's doing, so define add x is defining a function called add, which receives a parameter x. Uh, local is like var in JavaScript, so it's like a local uh, non-global variable. And that defines again a function called x add other 
which receives y, and that's the body of the function last thing. And then it returns that function it created. So the result of this, if you run, if you're like me and you love Emacs, that's what you get. Uh, so you define, you define the, the adder, no, sorry, you evaluate that, and then you create an adder function, and then you can call it. Okay, so that was complicated, too many parentheses, but we can do exactly the same in JavaScript. So yay, curly brackets. Uh, so pretty much that's a literal one-to-one -one translation from the slide before. What you have in here is a function A receiving an X, and this function returns a function uh, without a name, which receives Y, and then all this function does is to add Y and X. So uh, further down, there's a variable adder where we call this function and put the result in. So when you call add seven, that will return to us a function that takes one argument and adds that argument to seven. So this is uh, what we call... Partial. No, not really, but... <laughs> not really. <laughs> so this is just, uh, it's, it's one of the ways you deal with higher order functions. In a, in a functional programming language and uh, in some other languages which are not purely functional, uh, functions can be passed around like they were classes. So think of that, if this was, say, Java or Ruby, I could easily have a, a function which receives a class as opposed to an object, it just receives the class and does something with it and passes around. In Ruby, you can open that class and do all sorts of crazy stuff. Don't do it. Uh, so what this code is doing then is just, sorry, just calling, um, so the first print actually, oh, no, hang on, I do have print out. That's the result on Chrome. So first I create adder, pass, um, create adder as a result of calling add passing seven. So I, what I receive back is this. So this is just printing the contents of the variable adder, and that's the contents, right? But unfortunately, Chrome can't understand that actually x was replaced by seven. So back, back up there, add x, then your x became the, what's in the return line. So this is effectively seven for this guy. And we know it's seven because when I call adder, the function adder passing in 10, it will add up with that seven and return 17. So this is how functional programs pretty much work. And this can help us a lot in JavaScript because we can go old school. Uh, can sure. No, it was just the example they had on the thing you couldn't read. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't write this thing altogether, but <laughs> just I'm just yeah, just translating from the book. So going old school uh, means uh, I, I'm going to so I have like 30 minutes. Um, I'm, I'll try to show three examples of how this can help you write more uh, less spaghetti JavaScript. Uh, so one thing is passing functions around, which is the whole concept of functional programming. You use a function just like you would use an object in some other um, languages. So I hope all, everyone can see that. Um, we have a function called add user. We see a lot of this kind of stuff. And add user receives a user and it has a variable that database, which just we connect to some database somewhere, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then it executes uh, on the DB the result of us SQL insert. So suppose I pass in a user, it will return insert into users and a bunch of values. So just abstract out the actual database details. Because the important thing is that we have to do some connection handling and uh, deal with exceptions if they happen. And that's very cool, but we working at SoundCloud, there's always an add track method somewhere. And that's the next one. So add track receives a track, connects to the database, uh, executes whatever the result of this guy is in the database, and handles exceptions and do all this kind of stuff. So in a reasonably sized JavaScript project, that will be the case like in one billion different places. There are ways, many different ways of dealing with that. And by the way, I'm not saying that's the right way or that's the only way. I've been to code bases where people are using object-oriented JavaScript in a very good way. At least I could do stuff with that. Uh, so it's just the way I prefer to write it. 
Um, so one of the first thing we can do, it's obvious, if we just we sit down and we try to sketch out uh, what's the common bits around this guy, right? So the common bits are the connection to the database and the fact that we execute something uh, passing an argument. So, and then we handle the database error. So I create a function called execute with connection. Um, and this function receives an argument and a function to execute. So it's a function that will receive a function and execute that. I could pass whatever function in there. Uh, because JavaScript has funny typing rules, we have to read the code to see that it's actually something that receives two uh, arguments. It must receive two arguments. So after we've done this, we can then rewrite our old functions, um, making them receive these two things, and then just have the execute line. We could even strip out execute maybe and make it part of this. But anyway, that's, what, that's the way we want to keep. So what we've done here is to create these two functions as something that don't know anything about database connections. Well, they know there is something as a database connection, but how do you get this database connection? No one knows. Uh, and also they don't have to handle errors. These functions are very close to be what we call pure functions, um, which are actually, they are pure functions, uh, but which are much, much easier to test, much easier to reason about, much easier to read. And why so? You have to read a book because I only have 30 minutes. Uh, but what we have to do after this is just to call execute with with connection, passing in add user, we pass in the function is going to be executed, and then we pass it some random guide. Uh, and we can also call execute with connection, passing in add track, and passing in some random track. So what's going to happen then is that it's going to fall into this guy, and add track and add user are going to replace function to execute. So when you do function to execute parentheses, which in JavaScript is invoke this function for me, it will execute the functions we defined before. So that way, we don't, have, um, we don't have all this repeated code across. We can just have one guy which does that. It's, all, it's a bit like aspect-oriented programming, or what we thought it would be like. Uh, and then you just pass in the function. Um, you can have billions and billions of this kind of function as long as they follow the protocol, which is it receives two things. The first one is the, um, the database, the database connection, sorry. So right, cool. So next thing we are able to do. So in JavaScript, we use closures a lot. Um, but we use them a lot mostly to mimic object orientation. So a closure is a, a, closure is a value defined within a scope. And you carry the scope with you when you pass functions around. So this function has access to whatever was in there when it was defined. It's a bit complicated, but hopefully it's going to get clear. Or you may have some JavaScript experience with the whole these and var and all that we do. Uh, so in this case, what we have a lot is something like this. So someone's trying hard to make their program oriented to functions and not have a lot of state across and having simpler, pure functions. But then we end up with something like that. We have, uh, we have a function called write comment. And there's one thing that I think every time I've worked in a high-profile website, we had to take care of is people abusing the website. So what we want to do is to make sure that if on the same session, the same request, a uh, web request, you made more than three things, uh, then yeah, no, you're a spammer. We don't want you to get out of here. Obviously, this is too simplistic. Uh, but that's kind of the stuff we have to deal with every now and then. Um, so what this function does then, it, uh, it receives a counter, some also, and a text. So it's the author of the comment, and then it's the text of the comment itself. And it checks if the count is higher than three. If so, just raise an exception, doesn't do anything anymore. Otherwise, it calls save comment, uh, passing in the author and the text, and it returns count plus one. Just so the next iteration you know how many times it's been through. And what you see here is that we instantiate the counter with zero, uh, that would be like, I don't know, when you create a session, or the HTTP session for that user, you instantiate that. But every time I call that function, I have to pass the counter in and make sure I'm getting the counter back. Very important. 
If I miss one of these, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm also passing the alpha and the text. And as you can see, I have no consistency with my quotes, which is bad. I would reject this, you know, um, code review. Uh, so after this, you get this message saying, after all this, I mean, you get this message saying, oh, we executed too, much, too many actions, uh, can't go ahead. So obviously, this gets complicated. And we're trying to use functions to simplify. Mm, not very sure that's the case. So things we can do is that uh, we can pretty much keep the right comment as it is. It's not bad. It's OK. Um, what we need to do is to add is to use closures in our favor. So with this function, uh, this is a function which receives an alpha and returns a function that uh, just calls write comment, pass in the alpha, pass it in there, and the counter. So there's two closures here. One is the alpha, because that's, you pass it in first, and then you, you, this value is available to this function we return at all times. And we're not going to change it. It's, it's definitely, the, whatever the alpha name was, it's going to be the same. Sorry. And also the counter. So the counter, we're starting with zero. Um, we get this guy with zero, and we do exactly the same we were doing before, but just within the function. Now, because this is a closure, what's going to happen is that that var counter is going to be accessible to the function at all times. So whenever we call the function, it can access the, the whatever is inside the counter object. With this, we can simplify our code a bit, and instead of, instead of having oh, backtracking slides, instead of having that kind of stuff, uh, where we have to pass everything at all times, I can have this, where I, the first thing I do is to make a customized function. So I call make write comment function, passing in the alpha that I'm going to use. I'm even calling this current user writes comment. Because, so this is a function. And I'm binding it to the current user. So I don't have to pass in the current user every time I call it anymore. It's already bound. Uh, and now, sir, I can just I can call this function we return, which is that function over there, just passing in the text, and it will know that it should well it, should, it will be started the counter will be started with zero, and then it will know that it has to increment well to replace the counter with whatever the result of that guy was. So we simplified a lot the interface of the function we're actually using. It's okay that our uh, function that actually does the work still needs all three things. And it's probably good because that makes it pure, easier to test, easier to reason about. But then this is, this is, um, this is great because you can just pass this function around and just do stuff with that. Comments? Questions? Huh? <laughs> so as the last example, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about functions that returns functions that returns functions. I think we only go two levels deep this time. But trust me, this is crazy shit. Um, so we also see a lot of this kind of stuff, where we have a method called delete user. And the delete user receives the current user, the guy who's performing the action of deleting someone, and the user they want to delete. Uh, and then what we do? Well, we don't want people randomly deleting other people. That's probably bad. Uh, but we also want admins to be able to delete those people. So what we have is uh, a check just in the very, very first line of the function where it's like if the user is trying to delete themselves, it's sad, but yeah. Uh, or if the guy is an admin, then okay, keep going, that's good. Ow. Um, otherwise, just throw an error and log and call the police. So obviously, we'll have a lot of similarities Again, it's a common protocol, right? So we have activate user, which is doing pretty much the reverse operation, but has the same restriction. I don't want people activating, you know, someone tries to fake someone else's email and try to activate their account. That's bad. We don't want that. We want to have the same check. And obviously, what happens is that, uh, so I call the function, I pass everyone, blah, blah, blah. Got an error when I was Tiga, who is not an admin, was trying to change Picalcado, who is not an admin. Admin to pick card was okay, pick card to pick card was okay. Same thing for activate user, pretty much the same. They have the same uh, contract when it comes to non functional requirements. They do different, they play different roles when business rules come in. 
but the whole check, everything around it, logging, transactional behavior, maybe it's all the same. And then how can functional programming help, me, help us with that? Uh, so again, we can create a function that returns a function. Um, this time, we have this function called make authorization checking function. Horrible name, yes. Uh, and it receives a function to execute. So this guy will receive a function and build all this uh, if-else logic around it and invoke it only there and only if uh, it was supposed to be invoked. So we receive that guy and then return a function which, which receives current user and user to modify. This function we create on the fly does the if check, executes if it's okay, otherwise throws an error. That means that we can write our functions like that. Uh, we can just have this very own, yeah. So this very simple version. And then again, there's another closure there. Can someone point it to me? Current user is a closure because we don't have to pass it anymore. All, all, everything current user is needed for is handled by the wrapping code. The actual code performing the action doesn't care. It could be anyone. Uh, so that's what we do. And then we can define safe, action, safe activate user as a function uh, and just call the make authoriz authorization allowed very long name function with activate user and then make authorization checking function with delete user. And now we have a safe delete user and a safe activate user. Oh, yep. Uh, no, it's, it's Greenfield. Because you use a lot of um, functions or some kind of solid backends? I mean, other people. All oh, right. Uh, or are they using a we, the, the rule of thumb for this is that we want you to use as little dependencies as you can. Mm -hmm. So, But it, that doesn't mean you have to build your own database. Mm -hmm. uh, you, if you think a database is required, then yes, by all means. And we never really rejected people for having dependencies. We just reject useless dependencies. And there's a lot of them. And the same question is, um, so when I would apply a private code, wouldn't it be a bad idea to always have this um, except and throw exceptions? Because mm -hmm. you know, not just crashes. No, no, it's fine. It's just like, it could be anything, right? It could be the way you handle uh, the connection. That's just because I was running this on a browser to test the code. Okay. But it could be whatever you, 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 and also for example, in SoundCloud we have, uh, we have practices in, we always log to standard output and we always log error to standard error because that's how a logging platform works. Uh, so this kind of code would be in there, uh, the code that deals with this. Do you have one more? <laughs> uh, would you actually invite someone who would submit code like this because then okay, you can show that you understood closures but there are obviously uh, other possibilities like mimicking, uh, mimicking object orientation in JavaScript, which would probably be more readable than this one because so uh, it, if it there's a certain level of closure devs, if someone is trying to read it who hasn't wrote it, it's probably hard to understand. So there's two things, right? Uh, I, as I, I think I said before, that's not the way to build JavaScript code, and object oriented JavaScript code can go very well as well. Uh, but if, you have, if you're having trouble trying to understand this code written in a functional way, with closures all the way down, I'd say it's probably not very good code. Uh, I haven't seen an example where it was good code. Maybe there is, but I haven't seen it. Uh, but one thing though is that if you decide to build it in a functional way, and you build it in a functional way and the code's okay functionally, awesome. If you try to decide to go in an object-oriented way and you build it, awesome. If you mix them both and you have no idea what you're doing because he used functions, he used objects, and it's like, oh, hang on, it's a bit different. So I'm not, I'm not saying it has to be the way, or even that's more readable. Uh, it's more readable to me, which I probably have a different background, but it's just, that's one way of making sure you, you get your dependencies correct to Actually, find. I tend to mix stuff because there are some ways where I see object orientations overhead, like passing callbacks. Mm -hmm. You don't have to specify a callback interface or something. But then you can actually pass a callback function, which is fine. But if you have like bigger objects, you need a lot of logic. 
mm -hmm. it's probably easier to have like a class. It could be the case. So your instantia thing and your function. It could be. Like it could be the case. My my point would only be that uh, give function program a try, and because people are building softwares with these kind of patterns forever. But as I said, it's not easy to find in literature. Unfortunately, it's getting better now. Uh, but there, there are ways to deal with the kind of things you may think is readable now. Mm -hmm. okay, with closures and function programming, it's easy to solve one specific problem, but when you extend the problem uh, one year later? Uh, I don't know about that, but it, we do take care, we do take all, everything in consideration. So we take your, your background as well. Uh, it, sometimes we receive people who have only done Java in a bank for 10 years. But the guy's really good at what he does. He's not good in web sphere, but he's good at in programming. It just happens that he had a good salary and never left. So we're looking at this guy in a different perspective than we're looking at the hacker who was working for Heroku. Uh, there's all these things. But the problem itself, uh, accessibility, yes. The problem is really simple. Uh, and, but what happens often is that we ask you to extend it after. Uh, no, there's only one problem, uh, and the programming language is whatever you want. Assembly no, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, where? So okay. So when we get to this stage, where we have the safe delete and safe add functions, which don't fit in this slide, uh, we start looking at those. Like, are those even necessary? Is uh, should I keep those functions? Should I just drop them and and move them away to? I don't know, just use the activate and delete record. Maybe, maybe you're just, the only reasons we had these functions before was because we needed, uh, we need to do all this check and now they're not necessary anymore. Could be the case, maybe not, maybe yes. So as I was saying now, there is plenty to learn from and every time someone talks about the callback hell in Node.js, it's like seriously, this is nothing new. This has been on forever. And those are the tools people have used since forever to build these kind of systems. The biggest problem, as I was saying before, is that literature and stuff which is oriented towards software engineering as opposed to computer science and even mathematics is not that easy to find. So uh, this is just some books, links in the, uh, in the last slide that kind of teach you different ways of doing uh, these kind of things. And um, to, uh, as a closing thought, it's, it's fun to you know, learn something, and it's also it, learning can be used for evil. A friend of mine who is an Emacs hacker, one of the best Emacs hackers I know, uh, he read Node's source code, and he knows a lot of Lisp. So he came up with LNode, which is an implementation of the concept of Node.js Node running inside Emacs. And this just makes no sense. But it's awesome, he made it, it's good, it works, it's fantastic. You can do, inside your IDE, you can run your own application, which runs on, awesome. Uh, so yeah, any more questions? <laughs> yeah, I just wonder, when someone applies and fails to get an interview, um, how long could he or she wait until apply for another time? Like right. <laughs> well, it's, it's very unlikely that we'll remember the person's name, so it's, it's probably not a good thing to ask me. Maybe we can ask him after. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, but I, I really, I'm really keen to have people apply. At least six months. Really? At least six months. See? At least six months. Um, now. Uh, yeah, more? Well, I'll be at the pub. Um, I'm always at the pub. Uh, so we can continue this time. Cheers, thank you.